Hello. Hi. Hi, Dylan. Hi, Ashton. Hi, Hen. Hi, thanks for joining us. Glad to be here. And before we start discussing your PhD, Dylan, we were just wondering if you had any thoughts on community wellbeing, given that today is the last day of National Reconciliation Week. Yeah, I don't know. It feels like everyone's being overloaded by stressful events all the time now. And I think the excessive anxiety can, can easily build up and that start that can negatively impact upon um, our relationships um, with each other and within our community. So I think being able to think clearly and um, manage these emotional states is it's really more important than ever if we want to take care of ourselves and those around us. So I think that's where meditation um, can help. Absolutely, yeah. And so going on from that, your PhD topic is incredibly relevant to that theme of well-being, um, including community well-being. Um, can you tell us a bit about how your interest in meditation initially came about? Yeah. Uh, I grew up with, I had terrible anxiety growing up and I found the whole experience um, pretty challenging and confusing. Uh, so I guess I was looking for ways uh, to manage my mind, uh, understand what was going on. So I started reading something by the Dalai Lama. I think it was The Art of Happiness. I think that came out around uh, the same time. Um, and it just seemed like there was something to it, something sort of very grounded and, and sane about the approach to understanding your mind, sort of try this practice and see what happens. It's almost scientific. Um, and the fact that the meditation was sort of advertising um, the development of mental, uh, uh, mental alertness and focus, as well as physical and emotional calm, I thought that was pretty good. Uh, so, so I, since then, I began um, doing my own personal practice and then eventually um, joined some groups and, and found some teachers. Fantastic. And obviously, the, the Dalai Yoda behind you is testament to the fact that <laughs> the continuing impact of the Dalai Lama um, <laughs> on your practice and your thinking. And um, maybe the impact of Star Wars as well. Both, very importantly. <laughs> <laughs> they go hand in hand. I um, mean, Jedi's are very zen, so that that seems to make sense. They true. maybe have some meditation experience. There must be some Star Wars meditations floating around, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, I haven't um, tapped into using the Force yet, but we'll get <laughs> that's the next. Step. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, Dylan, what can you tell us about your PhD research project, which investigated the effects of concentrated meditation on electrical brain activity? Well, I had my interest in meditation and then um, I started uni. I did biological science at Flinders University. Uh, I picked up some neuroscience topics and began to get more interested in, in that side of things. And so I wanted to combine the two and I was given a really uh, good opportunity uh, to study a project at Flinders Medical Centre where I could look at um, how meditation affected brain activity. Um, it was actually the first study to examine the different states of meditative absorption, which were described or have, are described in, in the Buddhist tradition. Uh, so we had 24 subjects. 12 of those were experienced meditators from life flow and 12 of those were non-meditators and they were both matched up for um, a variety of things. And we expected that the changes in electrical activity from the brain that we recorded uh, would correlate or reflect to these varying states that the meditators were able to go through. And that's exactly what we found, um, which, was, which was good. Um, the meditators achieved different uh, brain states and controls um, and the changes in brain waves followed that uh, progressive pattern of... Um, intensifying as the states deepened and so as they went deeper into meditation uh, a lower frequency called theta activity uh, that increased and higher frequencies which are called beta and gamma uh, they actually decreased um, and so what that means is uh, the theta which we found in the front of the brain um, and involved in other attentional sort of networks um, may have been linked to boosting attention towards relevant stimuli and suppressing 
sort of evaluating and interpreting processes. So better at focusing on what matters and limiting sort of cutting out unwanted distractions. Mm. Um, and the beta and gamma, which decreased and then uh, went back up again as they came out of these states, same with beta, um, is often associated with higher cognitive function. And so these decreases uh, may have been reflective of deactivation of processes like mind wandering or mental chatter. Um, and that, that tees up with what the meditators report during their experience, which is diminished thinking and a sort of a mental stillness. Cool. That sounds like such a fascinating PhD. Were there any particular research highlights for you? Getting positive results I could publish, <laughs> certainly <laughs> one of them. Um, it was it was an amazing time. Um, just working with terrific colleagues at the lab, the Brain Signals Lab, and um, having five wonderful supervisors, very supportive, um, and working with the Life Flow Meditation um, members was was really good because I get to know them and and learn a lot more about meditation as well as as we went through the study. So um, I think they were the they were the highlights. Cool. And for people who are just hearing about Life Flow now, we'll actually be doing a meditation session with someone from Life Flow after this that you know quite well, Dylan. Yes. Yeah. One of uh, my supervisors and um, mentors um, and a subject in the experiment uh, was, <laughs> was uh, <laughs> the team John Burston, um, which will be guiding some meditations up, up very shortly. That's, very that's cool. So with us. So good. Yeah, it's fantastic to give people a bit of a chance to maybe, if they're listening to what you're saying and thinking, oh, I think I could do with some of that in my life, there's mm -hmm. a chance today to, to dip their toe in and have a bit of a try. Absolutely. So we've talked a bit about the positive things. Were there any challenging aspect, aspects in particular about the research? Um, <clears throat> I think at the beginning it took a little bit of work to convince my main supervisor. He was is emeritus professor of neurology John Willoughby and a little bit wary of meditation um so when I was pitching the idea he was sort of like oh, I'll have to look at this carefully um so when John Burston and Graham Williams Dr Graham Williams also from Life Flow came in um they got a fairly thorough examination from John um not not in an unkind way just to make sure that the language and ideas they were using would be sort of compatible from a scientific perspective and that we could actually you know, use them in, a, in an experiment and it made sense. Um, but I think probably the most um, difficult or challenging aspect was not for me but for the subjects that I put through the experiments. <laughs> um, and I think the success of the research project is a testament to uh, the quality of meditation done at Lifeflow because I put them through a lot <laughs> and they endured it with grace. <laughs> um, for example, they were in the lab for four hours in total. Uh, three of those were tethered to a computer with a hundred over 100 electrodes from their scalp, wires measuring um, respiration, heart rate, blood pressure, and I flashed strobing lights in their eyes, I gave them electrical <laughs> shocks, I made them sit through grueling attention tasks and they, yeah, they, they tolerated it very well. So, um, That's a testament to you as well. It sounds like you set up a, a safe space to do some of those things. I definitely requires lots of trust to be able to <laughs> ask that many <laughs> things of your participants. Okay. Dylan, where um, did you just um, just quickly that just made me wonder where did you find the people who hadn't done meditation before? Where did they come from? They were sort of advertised around the university and uh, medical centre, just mm -hmm. asking for people of a specific age range and um, sex and handedness. So we had to match the meditator with a non meditator. Uh, so that took a bit of work and a bit of to and froing, but um, they were, everyone was. Um, that are compensated for the time um, involved in the study. Fantastic. Mm. And so what do you hope that people will take away from the work that you've been doing? 
I think just that we're beginning to understand uh, more about the positive effects of meditation um, and on the body and the brain and I guess how that all works. Um, so the hope is that by continuing this research and understanding meditation more, we can refine the techniques for training our attention, regulating emotions. <clears throat> techniques in a that are, I guess, secular, scientifically based, and that, of course, I think that means more universally accessible um, <laughs> as the language and the, um, I guess, the concepts are not sort of defined by a particular, um, yeah, uh, culture or religion. Perhaps it's it's more available for for people to mm. access. Is that where you think some of the resistance comes from? You talked earlier about, um, sorry, I can't remember if it was your supervisor or one of your professors having that initial resistance to meditation. Yeah. Is that where you think that comes from? I think there's just so much um, under the title of meditation and mindfulness um, and it's interpreted in so many different ways um, and there are, you know, some some people could take advantage of the fact that they're in um situations where they're teaching people that putting their trust in them but also just trying to understand um carefully what what is actually happening rather than sort of having that faith that it, that it will happen or does happen but sort of i think that just makes for a better experience and, and better results <laughs> So. Absolutely, and you probably reach a lot more people as well because they'll be able to understand yeah. it from lots of different angles. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, and um, perhaps a really big question. Um, so, the next one is really: um, what should people be focusing on? Do you think for better well-being, or what what things do you think people should be focusing on? I think becoming more curious about your own mind and um, so trying to understand it a little bit better which, of course, meditation helps you to sort of reflect on, on that um, and in ways that can help reduce your own suffering and suffering of those around you. But not only that, but with, in ways that will help increase uh, your well-being um, and your potential to flourish. So uh, I think it's important that, that uh, there are techniques available that we can sort of use to understand ourselves better and our minds. Mm. Fantastic. And um, just a quick question from the chat as well. We've just had it come in. Um, so sometimes people who express calm can be wrongly labelled as inactive or quiet on political or activist issues, and some individuals wrestle with personal wellness and being involved with causes that can overwhelm them. So is there a line of research or data that has advice or techniques or information for this situation? Oh, that's a big one. Wow. <laughs> How much time do we have left? <laughs> Great question. Um, yeah. I, yeah, it's, it's, I think it's something that everyone has to sort of work through individually, but certainly having conversations widely with you know, open and respectful conversations with other people who are in similar circumstance. Um, I can't list uh, sort of the research off the top of my head. Um, but I think at the end, or there'll be links to some of the resources available online that they're very good at helping people to manage their um, thinking and emotions. It is that tricky balance, isn't it? I find as someone who's quite introverted, I struggle a bit to find that balance between wanting to be really socially and politically engaged and, and especially at the moment uh, with everything that's happening in the world, wanting to really be um, aware of things that are going on and support people. But it's also balancing that with making sure I'm recharging and that I'm in a proper state of mind to be able to respond positively and helpfully. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really tricky in this world where so much is happening and we're getting so much stimulus all the time to try and balance those things. Yeah, and I think exactly. if we ourselves uh, if we ourselves are too stressed or anxious or fearful, then when we communicate with other people, that, that's coming across and that doesn't really help the situation. Absolutely. It's so easy to accidentally project that energy onto other people. Yeah. <laughs> Which Especially can... when you're all trying to achieve something similar or, you know, hmm. or, or wanting or have it on the same page. But, yeah, that, that communication is so, 
so important in how we actually do that. Absolutely. Yeah. It really resonated for me, Dylan, what you said. Um, I think it was the answer to the first question about meditation being useful for anxiety. Um, even just hearing that, I was like, oh, I'm looking forward to this next session just to have a chance to find some space Yes. and a little moment to try and learn how to create space for ourselves as well. Mm -hmm. um, so the next question we'd love to ask you about, so you're currently working in science communication. Mm -hmm. What are you focusing on next? Uh, I'm just I like being creative, so um, I'm still very much enjoying my position at MOD. I get to uh, meet with researchers, learn about the science, and then um, work on ways to or develop new and interesting ways to sort of talk about science um, in ways that are meaningful and engaging. And so that's really, um, I'm a pig in mud at the moment. <laughs> I, I'm not really looking forward, I think, just to build on my skills and develop um, that as I go as I go along will be important. Awesome. And for people maybe that have um, come to MOD, have there been any particular parts of exhibits so far that um, you've been most proud of or most excited by? Uh, all of them. <laughs> um, not, I haven't been involved in all of them, but been proud of all of them. Um, I was involved in one of the early ones uh, called Feeling Human, which uh, in, um, sort of investigated people's perception of pain and looked at how um, sort of perception and psychology can really influence the, the physical pain. And some of the exhibits we had there, like a, a big chair that provided shocks to you, um, I think that was great in sort of uh, allowing people to understand more how this, how their perceptions influence the physical um, feeling of pain so I think that was really cool that's such a, a good one to bring up because that one um I've been lucky enough to work with that exhibition both at MOD but then we've also taken it to Tour Down Under and to WOMAD mm. for a couple of years and the reactions in each place have been so different I remember when we had it in the gallery people would walk into this very dark room and the chairs were under a spotlight and I remember once having a man who would have been in his mid-30s covered in tattoos and he was terrified of the pain chairs mm. whereas then when we took it to tour down under a lot of the people asked if we could turn it up and we had really interesting conversations and the answer was no uh safety but um, we had <laughs> really interesting conversations with them about endurance because they were all endurance sports people who were used to riding for hours on end with injuries so their perception of pain and pain management was entirely different it was really interesting yeah it's incredible to see how exhibits taken into a different context or to a different audience can mean something completely different or be um yeah, engaged with in such a different way. It's really fascinating. I'm glad we got to do that with that, with the feeling human. That was really interesting. Um, so Dylan, if people are interested in finding out more about your work, uh, where, would we, where would you suggest that we look? Uh, well, the mod webpage is a pretty good start. To, that's where I'm working. Um, I've been out of the sort of academic research um, field for a while, um, but in terms of meditation, um, I'm looking forward to sitting in with the next session with John. Um, but there are also some really good free meditation apps by Smiling Mind is a not-for-profit Aussie uh, app and Headspace, the app from the UK, is, is really good as well just for getting some basic techniques and, and um, familiarity with the, with the meditation. Awesome. And I think um, we'll have links for those in the chat so people can look into that further. And I think we also have a link to um, your research paper as well, Dylan. I think I've, yeah, that's in there too. Yeah. So have a read about this. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us. It's been really nice hearing about, uh, I guess we know you from MOD, so it's been really nice hearing about your research before coming to MOD. Thanks so much for sharing yeah. it. No, thanks for having me on.